Stan, I am Marina Butos, the author of Watch, and I see lots of copies in the laps here. So I just wanted to get a sense. You had the book for a, uh, about a month, is that correct? Or so? Or? Some half, some half. Some half, some half. Can I just get a sense of who has gotten how far in the book? Um, if you finished it, if you're a few chapters in, it just helps me to understand as I'm doing my presentation. <laughs> a few chapters in, okay. Don't, don't be shy, it's, it's totally fine. It just gives me a sense of where everybody's at. Hmm? First chapter, okay. Finished, okay, we got another finisher. <laughs> okay, so we have okay, so we've got, a, we've got a mix of what's going on here. So what I'm gonna do then is I'm actually gonna read a little section from the early part of the book. Um, I need two little sections just to get us into the world of the book. And then I wanna talk about how I even came to write this book in the first place. And then we definitely have to leave time for questions from you. Any kind of questions that can be about this book or just even what it's like to be a writer. Here we are at the Center for Fiction, devoted to fiction. And for those of you who are interested in reading fiction, perhaps writing yourself, I'm here to answer any questions and I'll try the best I can, okay? So first thing I'm gonna do is I am gonna read from a section that introduces us to Naeem, right? So Naeem, is an immigrant teenager, and I'm gonna kind of go back a little bit in time so we can just get a feeling for Naeem, the character. Oh, yeah, sure, you guys can follow along. Good idea. Page 20. I was 11. When I finally touched down on the ramp, my eyes sliding easy over the signs at JFK, international arrivals, baggage, non-US residents. I could barely sleep on the flight over. I was too excited. I didn't know that the blanket sealed in plastic was for me, or even the meal that came rattling on a cart on a plastic tray. I thought you had to buy everything, and I had no money. Until the lady next to me leaned over whispered, your mother wouldn't be happy if you don't touch your food. When I got off the plane, I squared my narrow shoulders. I was brave. I knew what passport line to stand in. The man there, his name tag, said Hernandez, and I tested it in my mouth. I liked how the Z buzzed against my teeth. Not bad, he grinned. You'll do well here, man. He knew I was before night. Nice boy, reunited with his father. What happened? Was it the fright when I did see Abba? Not in a photo, not on a hazy Skype screen. When I saw his sloping shoulders and thin gray hair, and that young girl beside him, she looked like my sister. In a purple charwa camise, a curly-haired boy hiked to her hip, waving frantically at me, as if they knew me. My heart shrank to a cold fruit pit. I did not know these people. I did not know the true sound of my father's voice. The way his head did a shaky tilt to the right when he spoke. How he drove funny, one hand each at the bottom of the steering wheel, so the car jerked forward on the Van Wick Expressway. He was a terrible driver, which made me ashamed. At night, I lay in my new bed under crisp sheets decorated with rocket ships and tried to memorize pieces of him. I heard his garble cough through the thin wall, then my stepmother murmuring as she massaged the small of his back, a bulging disc, the doctor had said. I tried and tried to make the pieces whole, but still, he was not mine. We were not. I heard a sound, feet padding on the floor from across the room. It was my little brother, who had gotten out of his own bed and was standing over me. His eyes shone like buttons in the dark. Maria, Zahir whispered, brother. He reached out and pressed a finger into my cheek hard, as if to see if I was real. 
I smiled in the dark. Then he climbed back into bed. Ever since then, it's as if I can always feel the indent of his finger on my skin. A month, a year, middle school sleep pod. I learned the rhythms of Elmhurst and Corona and Jackson Heights. I was fast, too fast, in all the wrong ways. I was snapping slang out of my mouth easy. I knew how to twist away from the teachers, how to use my backpack like a shield. I went to a nearby middle school and hung with the bottom of your crowd, the ones who put firecrackers in garbage cans and ran away. The ones who slouched in the back of class forgot their algebra books, their marked up essays. Whenever the work got hard, when I landed in a tangle of questions I couldn't answer, I gave up. My stepmother tried to help me with my homework, pushing her finger down the page. It's boring, I protested. Sometimes, but once you do the little things, it all starts to add up. Like here, just go over the verbs again. No, I twisted away, tears swimming in my eyes. It was embarrassing being tutored by my stepmother, who was only 10 years older than me. Up close, I saw the mole at the side of her mouth. Her face is very round, like a pan with a spray of pre freckles across her almond skin. Naeem, she urged, you have to study. There's no other way. I'm fine, Amma. It'll work out, really. Sometimes they called Abba to school, and he would stare at his shoes the whole time. Do you want a translator, the counselor would ask? No, he said at one of those meetings. As always, he kept his gaze on his shoes. I noticed a hole in the seam of one, which made me flush angry. After, on the way back home, Abba kept his head bowed. Jota shado koro, do your best, is all he could say as he shuffled into his bedroom. Don't be in trouble. In his eyes, I could see that he didn't know what to do with me, and I didn't know what to do with him. We had no words for who we were, who we were becoming. I'm just going to read one little section that is not so much about Naeem and his family, because that sort of introduces you to the Naeem, the before Naeem and the Naeem, who he sort of became as he came here to the U.S., but I'm going to read a little section from the whole idea of watching. So before I do, though, for those of you who haven't finished the book, okay, um, what do you think I mean by watched or watching? Any ideas? Anybody want to toss out? Especially those of you who are at the very beginning. Well, what does it make you think of when you think of watched or watching? Are there ways in your life you feel watched at times? Like cameras. Cameras. Yeah, so, so you see cameras kind of out on the street on kind of telephone poles in other places in okay. our school. There are people watching. <clears throat> there are people watching. Can you talk about that a little bit? Watching your actions and how you're raising them. Right, right. Okay. Any other ways that we think about watching? You can watch yourself grow into another person. Oh like yeah, you're change. sort of watching yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really, and that's part of what Naeem is going through. He's sort of seeing the transformations that he's going through. Yeah. So I'm going to read a little section about all of this is sort of woven into the novel itself, but I'm going to talk very specifically about the watching that Naeem feels and his community feels. So think about that and also think about if it, if it resonates in any way with any other kinds of watching that you may have experienced or thought about, okay? So we're going to read now from nine. The watching. It seeps into everything in our neighborhood. It's like weather, the barometric pressure lowering. Before the monsoons came in Bangladesh, you could hear the air thicken the squat on your head, a constant ache behind your eyeballs. For the past few years, there's been another kind of pressure, a vibration around us, the air pressing down, muffling our mouths. We see the men coming down the metal stairs from the elevated subway, or parked in cars for hours on end. Clean-cut guys, creased khakis, rolled-up sleeves, 
the breath of Manhattan steaming off their clothes. They aren't from around here. That we can tell. Not like the young couples with their big padded soldier strollers, or the girls with pea coats and holes in their black tights who move to the nice part of Jackson Heights, carry yoga mats and cloth bags from stores I've never heard of. No, these people are different. They stroll into stores, finger the edges of the newspapers on their racks, check out flyers taped to the side. So what kind of watching is that that Naive is now trying to describe to you? Excuse me? Movements. Movements of other people. Yeah, movements of other people, yeah. And specifically, what do you think they're, you know, and again, those of you who've read more of the book are, are welcome to chime in at this point. Yeah. Yeah, what kind of thing are they trying to do? So these guys are kind of coming down the, the stairwell of the of the subway, they're kind of noticing things. The scene that follows, in fact, they come into Naeem's parents' store and start to ask questions about the man who has a travel agency on top, on the second floor. Any thoughts about why they're doing what they're looking for? Something suspicious. Something suspicious, yeah. What might that be, though? What could it be? Something illegal, okay. And what kind of illegal? So he, it could have to do with, okay, so we certainly have that issue of whether undocumented, okay. Anything else, which is, you know, very much in the news right now and something that's, that's kind of crackling. What else are they looking for, trying to tease out, do you think? How he runs his business. So notice at the front of the book, I have this file. Yeah, so, and I do that in front of each section, right? And this is a file about that man who owns the travel agency above Naeem's. What do you think they're trying to tease out or dig out? Why would they care about this man with the travel agency? His name, um, you know, they keep saying they're going to keep a watch on him, spoke to Abdul Brahman, we see a store below, the travel agency, etc. These are detectives. Right. Why should they care? Illegal activities. Where is Nine from? He's from Bangladesh. And what do we know? Do you know anything about that country? So it's in South Asia. What religion? They're Muslims, okay? So, part of what's happening here is that the detectives are doing surveillance of this community because there's a large number of Muslims in the community. So this book is about watching in general and all the ways you guys talked about, right? But it's also about surveilling Muslim communities. So this is about Naeem, his story, his journey, but it's also about the watching that's happening and happened right here in New York City of Muslim communities. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I even came to write a story like this, and then I want you to pound me with as many questions as you can, okay? Yeah? Um, what is it called when you, I don't know, I'm just, I can't come up with the word, but when you prejudge somebody and you know, like the, when you stop people. Profiling and yeah, yeah, profiling. So, right, so what we're talking about is profiling, right, to some extent, or let, let's at least put that word out there. And what was stop and frisk? It's actually, a, it's actually something that they stopped, but when I was writing the book, stop and frisk actually still existed. What, what was stop and frisk? I'm sorry, say it again? Policy. Policy. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, when you stop someone and search them because of their color or something. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the idea is that there's supposed to be a reasonable suspicion, but what they discovered was that there was this sort of targeting of minority communities, right? So this is a similar thing, right? And in fact, if you read the first scene where he's running up to the um, to the subway trying to go reach his friend, that takes place at the Jackson Heights 74th Street stop. 
and there was quite a lot of stopping and frisking that happened, in fact. So, one of the things you may notice about my work is I write fiction, but I based it and ground it very much in real things that are going on. That there is actually research involved in the work I do, and then from there I sort of spin out a story, all right? And I like to think of this as my own tendency to take what is, what exists, and spin it into what if. What if a boy like Naeem is in this situation of his community being watched, right? Of all of this going on. And then we have some other things which is, has to do with where Naeem is in school and getting in trouble and all sorts of other things. But I'll get to that in a moment. So let me talk to you a little bit how I even came to this idea of watched. So let's hopefully I can, I can um, work this uh, back. All right, new ideas, where do they come from? Oh, did I do it? Great. <laughs> okay, so a number of years ago, I wrote a book called Ask Me No Questions. Ask Me No Questions was also about a Bangladeshi family that lives in Queens, and um, they were undocumented. I think somebody mentioned about documentation, right? So this was actually about an undocumented family right after 9-11, and what happened to them. And a lot of people said to me, write a sequel, write a sequel. But First of all, I'm not that kind of writer. I don't write sequels per se. And also the book was somewhat open-ended. I really want the reader to sort of think about it afterwards. But I was thinking about that world and what the next beat might be in that story. right here in New York City started telling me that there were informants in her classroom. This was at Hunter College, and I thought, really? <laughs> um, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, this whole idea that she was, she is a Muslim professor, but it's also the content, and a lot of Muslim students take her classes, and she started explaining there were these informants right on the campus, and they started explaining to me that yes, there was this unit that had been exposed um, that came out of the New York Police Department that was doing exactly what we've just been talking about, profiling, okay? Um, there were two journalists who exposed this program, wrote about it for the AP, they actually won something called the Pulitzer Prize for this, and it was, it was something that everybody kind of knew was happening, but it had never really been detailed. Um, so that everybody was sort of talking about this, and I, my ears perked up, because I started thinking, well, if the earlier story was about immigrants who are kind of invisible, undocumented immigrants, who have to sort of stay between the cracks, this is about being hyper-visible. Going back to that word watch, right? Those, those cameras you see everywhere, all those ways that we're watched, even watched by, you know, parents and neighbors and all of that. I really wanted to think about being a teenager and being watched. But you know what? That's an issue. As I said, I'm a fiction writer. I love thinking about these things, but I've got to find the story, right? So I had another conversation with someone else, a lawyer, and she told me that a young man had come into her office and kind of was hinting, he, well, he couldn't come right out with it, but he was swaggering in and saying that he was an informant. And in fact, he kind of liked it. In fact, his father had a small shop in Jackson Heights, and his feeling was he was going beyond his father. He was kind of moving with, you know, those who were in power. And yet at the same time, he felt sort of trapped in what he was doing. Because once you're on that road, it's not actually that easy to get out of it. And I thought, okay, that's when the novelist in me perked up and said, I've got a story. I don't just have an issue, I have a story. So what I really wanted to do was think about that word, yeah, watched. And 
and um, write about a boy who goes through this dilemma, who's put in this situation, and maybe even enjoys it on some level. So I did a certain amount of research. This is um, sort of the idea that I developed about it. Um, a young boy, a uh, young Muslim American boy, who's very aware of his community being watched, He's not doing too well in school, despite all his, what his family wanted for him and bringing him over. And he moves from being watched to himself being a watcher. And I wanted to think, what's that like? You know, what would that be like for a young man to go through that process? Is crawler actual terminology? Yes, yeah. it is actually. Crawler mm -hmm. is the term they use specifically. I mean, they, they actually tend to use that for watching mosques, okay? Mosque crawler is what they'll call them. Yeah. So um, sometimes they are informants, sometimes they are detectives, but most often it's informants are called crawlers. Okay. Now, Again, I keep telling you that I have these ideas, but you know, it's not so easy to just take a big idea. So where can I, I'm not a young Muslim American boy. I did grow up in Queens though, I will say that. Um, and you know, I have to get inside of that experience. So how can I get inside of that experience? So the first thing I did is, I thought about boys, okay? I thought about young boys. These are my young boys. These are my sons. <laughs> Um, yep, that's my older boy and that's my younger boy. They are 16 and 12 now. That's from when they were 15 and 11. And so I've been around a lot of boys over the last few years. In fact, I would say I'm a barrel that's full of boy stories, okay? I watch them, I think about them, and in my mind, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have brothers? Okay, tell me if you think this is true. To me, Brothers, at least, you know, my two boys are like puppy dogs. They fight, they love. They fight, they love. They tumble, they hate each other one moment, they love each other the next moment. Um, last night I was trying to cook dinner and instead of them helping me set the table, they were racing each other around the house, right? Even at 16, my older boy's still doing this. So I was really interested in kind of boys and their energy and two brothers, if I could draw from that. And so that's why I have Naeem and his younger brother, because it's about that. And it's also about his desire to be a good older brother, despite being a screw up to his younger brother. He wants to be a hero, because that's something else I brought in there. How many of you like comic books? I'm curious. Okay, which comic books do you like? Anything Marvel. Anything Marvel. Okay, you're totally into the Marvel universe. Got it, got it. Any other um, lovers of comic books or likers of comic books? I think a few of you. So I, my kids are totally, my older son not so much anymore, but they were steeped in comic books. My younger son, Spider-Man this, Spider-Man that, you know, like stickers. We only just recently took all the Spider-Man stickers off of his walls and you know, he's now moved on to kind of, he's in a different stage. But I really thought there's something about wanting to be a hero in comic books. So I wove that into it as well. The other thing that's really interesting when you write a book like this, when it's based on real events, is that then more real events happen. Like I took from the headlines and then more headlines are happening while I'm writing. So I don't know if you guys remember, but we had, the Boston bombers had already happened, but we had two attacks in Paris. We had a, another attack in San Bernardino, and we had the rise of something called ISIS, which is a radical group that's starting to recruit young people online. So I thought, you know what? If I'm kind of in this territory, I have to bring that into my story in some way. So I had to change it a little bit. I also went out to Jackson Heights, where it's set. I was actually born in Jackson Heights, so for me it was a nice return. I, I spend a lot of time there, but I really like it. There's me with my, no, my handy notebook, taking notes, thinking. That's what a writer does. I always carry a notebook, and sadly, that particular notebook I lost, because I travel with it so much I actually forgot it somewhere, which breaks my heart. But um, always kind of with a notebook observing. And this is sort of the little details. 
the neighborhood that I'm trying to take in and absorb to build the world. 73rd Street is a kind of little Bangladesh in Jackson Heights, where many of the shops are. For those of you who read the first chapter, that's the little plastic froggy in Bangles. Um, still out there, you can see it right there. The kinds of little shops I was writing about. The grocery shop. The little mosques that Naive will, as a crawler, have to, in some way, spy on and watch when he becomes a watcher. Do you look at these, do you take these pictures when you're exploring and then look at them when you're writing? Or these are for us? <laughs> um, I kind of use them, yeah, I use them as, as a kind of record, yeah. I mean, I didn't actually have to look at them so much because pretty much, it's almost the taking embeds it in me, in, for me. Uh -huh. um, Hmm? Is this part of the setting? Yeah, but it's sort of there to reassure me, and then I knew that I would be talking to people, and I wanted people to sort of see what I drew from. So a lot of it, you know, for me, a lot of it is translating it into writing. So I would be, so that would be a great example. I think I have one of those descriptions where you have to, you have to duck your head to go into one of the, because it's a kind of low wall, um, and I, and so. I was constantly making notes. There's another one with sort of thick strips, plastic strips. It's a mosque, and um, it's actually where a lot of the taxi drivers, and that's right over in 28th Street. I was always sort of looking and picking up details. So as a writer, I tend to write things down, but I'm very visual. So for me, the camera is always part of what I like to, to make use of um, in my work. The last thing I wanted to think about, because Again, it's a story, right? It is how many of you guys know what the Odyssey or an Odyssey is? What is an Odyssey? Yeah. You read the you read the Odyssey. So what do you think of well what was it about? It's about a journey. Yeah, it's about a journey. Exactly. I mean there's a hero who has to sort of leave home and is tested in all these different ways before he can return back home. We think of that as the classic hero's journey, and he returns home changed in some way, and there's a series of tests he goes through. So for me, as I was conceiving of this book, and conceiving of a young man who went from being watched to a watcher, and kind of being put in a funny dilemma, like he's kind of watching his own community, to talk about that a little bit. His friends, you know, what's that about? He's going through his own kind of odyssey, right? And so that's the, that's what I had to think about. So his odyssey is, of course, all over Queens and New York. It's a very New York book. It's a very Queens book. I'm really into. I was really into using a lot of Queens. Um, maybe for me, it was like a return to my, where I grew up, and I got to make use of that. Oh, okay, another city right there. <laughs> And really, I wanted to think about who Naeem is. Who does he become when he returns? So that was really the idea behind it. So I'm going to pause there because I want questions from you guys. Um, again, I know that some of you are at different phases in the reading of the book, but I would love to have some questions. Or maybe I'm going to start with one question and maybe you guys will have some questions for me, okay? What do you think about being in a situation where you're given an opportunity to be an informant? Do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing? Hmm? That's a great idea. So an informant is somebody who is, you're, you're in the community, and you are kind of the eyes and ears, and you are giving information to the police or the FBI um, about your community. <laughs> you know, it's really funny because I almost wrote a book called Snitch, and then I got caught up in the, you know, I, I never told this whole story. I was actually going to do a story that was about snitching um, in Newark, actually. Because uh, I live in New Jersey and I live near Newark, and I was thinking of writing a 24 hour Odyssey story of somebody trying to decide whether to snitch or not. But um, 
then this whole other story came in, but it's the same idea, right? It's, this, it's totally, and it's not just snitching one time. It's not just kind of giving, you know, when the cops pressure you to kind of know about one incident. It's actually being on the book, you're being paid to do this, right? It's you are, you know, and they kind of would pay him cash, sort of 200 here, 400 here, and eventually, if you keep going in the book, you'll see that, you know, they're kind of displaying and offering a pretty, like a kind of dazzling little offer to him, to pay him. <laughs> so what do you guys think about either snitching, informing, or, you know, police inform enforcement making use of this? What do you guys think? What if you have to inform about your on your family? Yeah. That's a pretty tough spot to be in, right? You're 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 kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. It's like, do you stay with your family, or do you do this situation? Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts. Other thoughts about informing. And can anybody, would anybody, can anybody see a good reason to inform? To help, yeah, talk about that. Yeah, if they were going to hurt somebody and hurt an entire group of people, which could be in the community, I can kind of see it, but yeah, it's so, such a gray area. It's a gray area, yeah. Yeah, you got to you have to have courage to do that. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's really, when you say, yeah, because the question is, is he a hero or is he an anti-hero? Like, are you a hero protecting your community? Because what if? What if you know somebody? Let's just say, what if you know somebody who's going online and getting a little sucked into that stuff online, that kind of weird stuff over there, you know? <laughs> You know, that's, so what do you do? Are you, are you doing good doing that? Are you protecting others? Or are you snitching, right? It's, it's not so easy, right? Um, How do you know if you're right? Right, right. right. Is this the best way to tell? And then here's the other thing. Naeem is like a lot of these kids who get themselves, and not just kids, but people, who get themselves in these positions. They're not like, it's not like, oh, I went out to be an informant, right? He got himself in trouble. The police in some way pressured him. Yeah, and got him nervous about his parents are immigrants. He's a little, you know, they kind of implied like, ooh, your father's on a green card. We can, right? Threatening, but it puts a little bit of you know making you feel the pressure, right? So Naeem's choice is it a choice, right? Like you said, it takes courage, but you know it's kind of hard to figure out when you're kind of put in a corner a little bit. So that's you know another thing that I was really trying to think about. I really was trying to write a story that's not sort of black and white, where it's like good bad, but this kind of weird gray area. You get put in because life is sort of like that. It's not actually that simple. We think we want it to be. We want to have heroes. We want to have anti-heroes. We want to have the bad guy. We want to have the good guy. But you know, that's it's not always so clear. And the funny thing is for Naeem, this is a kid who can never finish anything. It's like he's almost gonna graduate and he forgets to hand in the essay to his teacher. He's almost gonna do this. He, he, he's falling behind, he doesn't go to math lab. Right? And it was like, oh, come on already. And doing this work, he actually starts to follow through. He actually starts to kind of feel good about himself. So that's another complication in the journey. Right? All right. I, again, I want to hear questions from you, questions about writing, anything that comes to mind. Yeah. So um, I wrote sort of the initial, so you notice that the book is divided into sections, right? So I wrote part one pretty quickly 
but then worked on it for a few months to kind of get it right, to really develop it. So I knew, what I like to think of the part one is, is it's sort of like the opening gambit of the book. Um, and then, in fact, the book was sold to a publisher who said, I want it. You know, I want it as quickly as you could do it. So I had to write it pretty quickly. Um, and I think, you know, all told, maybe it was sort of, it took me about a year to write um, this book. With lots of revisions and going back and forth with my, it, this one is somewhat fast, yeah. Um, but I worked very intensely and very focused on it. I mean, whenever I had a spare moment, I would try to work on it. And then we would go back and forth. So I think it was a little, maybe a little over a year that it took to write. Yeah. What did you come up with the name? Naeem. Yeah, a lot of people ask me. So, um, and I'll tell you, Naeem, that spelling of Naeem is an unusual spelling. It's usually N-A-I-M, but for whatever reason, the reason is I have a friend who's Naeem. And <laughs> I don't know. I try, I actually thought, oh, that's bad. I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, use my friend's name, and he has the unusual spelling. And every time I tried to change it, it just didn't work. And the main character of Ask Me No Questions, the other novel, was called uh, Nadira. And for some reason, I wanted to stay in the N sound. <laughs> it's funny. You, you can't explain these things exactly. I know little bits of, of Bangla is what it's called. So I am not Bangladeshi. Um, but I lived for a short while in, not Bangladesh, but the area, it's Bengal is a, is a region of South Asia. So there's West Bengal, which is in India, and what might be called East Bengal, or Bangladesh, is right next door. And so I lived in Kolkata in, in West Bengal. So I heard the language and kind of got to know Bengali culture. A little different from Bangladesh, but I, I felt comfortable enough um, but I had to really kind of think about it. I just felt sort of like, oh, I, I, I get, I, I can be inside of this. Um, for this book and the other book, I made sure that my friends, my Bengali friends, took a look at everything. <laughs> um, and made sure that I didn't make any like terrible mistakes and also that the, some, of the, some of the phrases I was using, I was using them correctly. Yeah. I do still teach, yeah, I teach, so I, I'm a professor of English at um, William Patterson University, which is a state university in New Jersey, yeah, and um, I teach writing, I teach some literature, all different kinds of writing courses, fiction, nonfiction. yeah. Did you set out to be a young adult writer? Yeah, okay. I did not. Um, my first two novels were adult novels, and um, but when I was your age and even a little younger, I loved young adult. Um, I just and I, 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 yeah, and I think a lot of adults still love it. And I, I just knew at some point I was going to start writing it. And I don't think of myself as exclusively a young adult writer, but I knew that there was something I could kind of tap into that I loved. Um, so I just tried my hand the first time, which was asked me. I had, actually, that's not true. I had done a nonfiction book called Remix, Conversations with Immigrant Teenagers. Um, and that was sort of my dipping my toe in. And then I kept going. And so it was sort of like I fell into it and, and, and enjoyed it, and enjoyed what it taught me as a writer. Um, I just realized, let me hear your other questions, because I wanted to do the, the website, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, we're just going to bring up, yeah, keep, keep asking questions, because how would you guys like to see real surveillance documents? No, actually, the first novel that I published is an, is an adult novel called House of Waiting. And then I published another novel called The Professor of Light. So those were both adult novels. And The Professor of Light was actually a kind of coming of age story. It is about a girl as she's growing up. And I kept, and to your question, I kept thinking, I still want to write about young people. You know, I don't only want to write about that, but I wanted to feel as if I could keep, I'm writing for this audience. And so at that point I started thinking, you know what, I also want to do an adult. Um, are you an English major? 
I bounced around a little bit. I was one of those people who couldn't decide. Uh, and uh, I think I first began, I began as a drama. Actually, I was going to study theater. And then I left the school I was at and went to a different school. And I wanted to do everything. Um, I wanted to do history. I wanted to do art. I wanted to do film. I, I really was like all over the place. And then ultimately sort of the writing and comp comparative literature. And then ultimately really the siren call of writing kicked in, and so I made, I did major in English, ultimately, but not without zigzagging around a little bit, and, and sort of all of those things filtered in, like my interest in film and writing always were kind of fused in a way, I, I somewhat think, so my writing is always somehow a little bit visual, because I'm somewhat thinking almost, it's, it's, it's a novel, but, but there's a film, there's a little bit of a film school. I, I, I take my cues a little bit. Oh, great. Okay. Let's just, I want to show you guys something that I think you might say. Take a moment. Other questions while I'm just bringing up my website? Sugar Change the World, which has been a very popular book. This is actually our new book called Eyes of the World. It just literally came out two weeks ago. Um, but Sugar Change the World and Ask Me No Questions, which was published 10 years ago, seem to be the most popular. Is it about the evils of sugar? It's not so much about the evils. It's about the history of sugar, how this one substance, and if we have a website, by the way, that's just sugarchangetheworld.com, and you can find lots of videos and links and so forth. But it all began, again, it all, there's always these nuggets, right? It began because my ancestors, which I always knew, came from India to the Caribbean to work sugar plantations, right? Anybody here who has background in the Caribbean? Oh, where, where, where in the Caribbean? What? Haiti, okay, big sugar island, right? Um, and the first, you know, the, actually the first labor revolt happened in Haiti, really important uh, piece of history for us. So all over the New World was sugar. So I, my, my relatives were brought over to work the sugar plantations, okay, from India. My husband's family, we discovered, had sugar in his background, but from beet sugar in Russia. So we thought, isn't this interesting? This one substance, two families, different backgrounds in the world, and how sugar changed lives. It moved people, Africans, you know, who were enslaved and taken over to the sugar lands, my relatives. And then there's also this beet sugar story. So we kind of tell this history through this one substance of sugar. But let me just quickly bring this up to you, because this is kind of an interesting thing. You can ask as many questions as you want, so I'm just going to pull this up. Okay. So this is... All right. Any of you guys recognize this, where we are? Can you tell from this map where we are on this map? Yeah, but can you tell what this, what this is, what this is? Where are you? That's Queens on the right, no? Yup, that's Queens. Queens on the right, exactly. And in fact, Travers Park, see here's Jackson Heights, and Travers Park is actually a park that I use in many of my scenes. There, absolutely, there's Queens Boulevard. Um, you know, all of this I kind of use in the novel. This is not my book, this is somebody else's book, but they have this map. Um, where are we here? Yeah, this is exactly not far from where we are. So, this is a website that was created by the journalist who exposed the story. 
of the spine. And they've done a really amazing thing that I love to share with students, especially those who have read the book. So, these are actual documents, right, that show the surveillance. We've got internet cafes, sports venues, travel agencies, right? Which would you like to see? Internet cafes. Internet cafes, okay, let's try that. Wait a minute, that's like right where I live. <laughs> so for them, it was kind of my 
mind-blowing to realize that this surveillance had happened, and this was right around the corner from the school where I was, okay? So this is like a long list of little places where, you know, this, they're giving you high school students, oh, so it's probably that high school student that, um, that the high school I was in, high school students playing online video games and smoking, okay? Location charges $3 for an hour of internet usage. So why are they looking at internet cafes? Hmm? Yeah, but like, okay, so they use it. You were talking about the recruiting and ISIS and whatnot, and they do most of their recruiting online. Right. They're sort of trying to get a you know, feeling like, or is there any suspicious exactly. activity or whatever. Right, exactly. So, I mean, it's kind of funny, you know, I'm sure just to see like, high school students smoking, watching a lot of, you know, that's what kids just do, right? But this is what they were watching and trying to keep an eye on. And then they always know whether there's a mosque nearby. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. Would you ever like make a movie or a series about, you know, this topic? Because it's really interesting and it's, you know, realistic. Have you ever thought about that? Well, you know, there is a filmmaker who has optioned it for film. Um, and so I have two thoughts about it, actually. So I'm hoping the film gets made, obviously. Um, it would be terrific, because I think it would make a really interesting film. Um, but I am also, these days, as per your thought, I'm actually thinking about um, the question of a series, make, you know, about this neighborhood and these kinds of, this would be one of many stories, right? Um, so that's actually something that's on my mind. If I'm, it's a new form for me, so I have to figure this out. But yes, it's kind of on my mind. Does your publisher do that work for you? No, I mean, people approach you if they're interested. So I have uh, both this novel and another novel, mm -hmm. filmmakers approached me about adapting it. They're it's very hard to get filming, getting money and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I'll be really honest, if, if you want me to be really blunt, it's very hard to get Films made where the main characters are not white. Okay. I'm just being, you know, honest about it. Um, Hollywood hasn't really changed. It's it's changing slightly, yeah. but it's 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 more of an uphill battle. Um, but as you say, this is kind of relevant to now, and so I'm sort of hoping people, and it's very much now. <laughs> um, so I'm sort of hoping maybe people realize that, and um, and so. Uh, you know, that may be, that may help in getting it made. But no, the, the publisher really isn't that, I mean, they'll, yeah, they're not that involved. Do you have an agent with it, or you have to do all that yourself? So the or agent, um, this ha the, 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 um, these two possibilities came because people knew my work, they read it, and they approached me. Um, but sometimes it comes through an agent or your sub-agent. You'll have a sub-film agent mm -hmm. who's trying to get people interested. Like, our, we have a new, this new book that's come out, this nonfiction book, and apparently people have started asking. It, I will tell you honestly, you know, film is just this other world where a lot of things happen or don't happen. Mm -hmm. It's actually a lot easier to... Right? And yeah, I mean, it's not that easy, but, but it's a lot easier because there's a lot less money involved, right? And you know, moving pieces. Who are you casting? Who's the director? When's it going to be filmed? This money, and, you know, lining it all up is very tricky. Though, we live in a world right now with Netflix and so much amazing stuff right now. I'm sorry, you say? Yeah, well, I mean, it, Netflix has to be interested and buy it. But yes, I think now, I think it's a really, accept, I mean, I'm saying this as a novelist and a book person, but I love a lot of what I see. Um, and I think they're doing really interesting things with those. See, I'm, I'm in the middle of watching 13 Reasons yes, Why. I was just talking about that coming out. With my son, yeah, yeah, yeah. my 12 year old, who loves it. And, and it's very hard for me to get him interested in fiction. So now we get to talk a lot about this. Did your boys like to read? They did. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't know. You guys are high schoolers, you know. So which grade are you guys in? 11. Oh, my son's a junior. So, you know, part of what's hard is he, feel, he like does a lot of reading for school. And so getting him to read outside of school, he does do it, but he 
feels a lot of pressure and weight from all the tests and everything. So um, he used to be a voracious. When he reads, he like tears through things really fast. But but it's kind of kicking him into gear outside of the school reading is sometimes an uphill battle. Yeah. Um, and my younger one's off and on. He's a, and and more he he used to be more of a nonfiction reader, but I think things like Thirteen Reasons Why. <laughs> Are getting him into realizing how interesting fiction is and characters, and so I, I, that's why I think it's really kind of exciting what's going on because I think it's pulling him back into fiction myself. So I, I'm not one of these people who's like against all that. I actually think they can they can richly feed each other in a way. What's my opinion? Oh, on the on on the series. Um, well, let me ask you guys first. I'm curious to hear. Are you guys hooked? I'm only in the fourth episode, I think. I don't know how many episodes there are. There are actually thirteen, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm only on the fourth, I think. <laughs> Other people are hooked a little bit. Do you think it's realistic? No, I know it. I want to see it. I'm rewatching it. I feel like it is. You do feel it's realistic. Probably something similar to what you're talking about. Somebody probably took the concept of a real situation that happened and they yeah. just make it fictional so other people can understand it, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I've been pretty impressed. Because sometimes, like, I mean, occasionally sometimes I think the portrayal of the jocks is a little bit cliched, mm -hmm. um, like the jock guys. Yeah. But, um, but I, I've been really impressed um, because because very often portrayal of teenagers on TV it just feels a little fake, or I just can't quite picture their, those conversations. Like, oh, this is a 25 year old pretending to be a teenager and pretending to have a conversation, and it doesn't quite. And the thing that I'm hearing in the dialogue that kind of works again because I'm around a lot of 16 year olds um, is just sort of the the jokes and the way they cut at each other and all for joking. You guys must know this. Um, so that feels very real. Um, the interaction with the parents and the teenagers feels really real. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's I think there's a lot that's that's very interesting. I also like that it's personally I really like that they're portraying a very diverse high school. They're not making an issue of it. It's not like this person is that race or whatever. I just like that it's showing a California high school and it's quite a mix. Um, and I, 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 I felt like that's also a texture that seems real. <laughs>